Good evening there, everybody. What is happening? Hopefully, you all are having a wonderful day today. So, anyways, when it comes down to it, I thought that I would review this little video that I found very particularly interesting. And this is going to be a video by the boxing channel known as Dante's Boxing Nation, who, of course, <laughs> from what we reviewed in the past, we do know that, of course, he was not a very big fan of Mr. Saul Canelo Alvarez. And once again, this is another reminder to the people that may be on my channel. This is not a fanboy channel. I overall do not have any certain fighters that overall I'm going to put in a certain light just because I may like them better than more than the other. I'm not a person all in all that has any certain biases, or at least not to the degree to where it affects my logic and objectivity. But anyways, Mr. Sewell Canelo Alvarez, who I do believe to be one of the best fighters of this generation, probably of the past, I don't know how many years. Of course, in his last fight, he did lose against that of the light heavyweight champion of the world, or one of them, the WBA light heavyweight champion of the world, Mr. Dimitri Bebo. And not only did he lose, but in my opinion, he pretty much lost somewhat dominantly. And when I say dominantly, I'm talking about probably around eight rounds to four. I believe the judges scored it about seven rounds to five, which I thought personally was a little bit generous, but it is what it is. Either way, Canelo Alvarez, apparently for his next fight, he has stated that he is not going to be facing Jamal Charlo or David Benavidez or Dimitri Bivo in a rematch, but that his next fight, just as originally planned, that he is going to fight that of Gennady Chupaji Golovkin in that of the trilogy fight. And I do believe that that is the correct fight for Canelo Alvarez to take, not only because is it somewhat of unfinished business, at least in some people's eyes, but I do believe that Canelo Alvarez, after a loss like this, I do believe that he is going to need a confidence booster. I do believe that he needs to look at things from an eagle eyes point of view. And when I'm saying that, I think that he needs to look back on things, reflect, grow, and learn from certain things. That is if he has a chance of possibly defeating Dimitri Bivo and maybe even defeating, and in my view, Canelo Alvarez more than likely will defeat some of these other top contenders anyway. But you never truly know because when a fighter suffers a loss the way that Canelo Alvarez did, a fighter sometimes mentally, especially more than physically, is never the same fighter ever again. Now, of course, we've seen many, many years ago that Canelo Alvarez, when he ended up losing to that of Floyd Mayer the Jr., Canelo Alvarez, in my opinion, he not only ended up adjusting very well, at least after the Floyd Mayer the Jr. fights, but then eventually he would later on to become, at least in my view and the majority of the world's opinions, the number one pounder pound fighter until that loss to Demetri Bivol. But there is a complete difference in losing to the number one pounder pound fighter, probably not only of this past generation, but in many people's minds, the number one pounder pound fighter in the history of boxing, when it comes down to it, and losing to a fighter in Demetri Bivol, even though he was a great challenge, you were the favorite to win that fight. So Canelo Alvarez right now, it seems very painful more than likely for him that he ended up losing that fight. But I do believe that sometimes with certain losses that it can help you transition into the next period as a fighter. We will see if Canelo Alvarez, if he will be a person who can rebound from the loss or will overall he be like Deontay Wilder with that Tyson Fury trilogy? Will he be a person that just overall cannot adjust to the point or overall can he not beat Demetri Bivo? And I do give Canelo Alvarez a certain amount of credit because I do think that Demetri Bivo wasn't a great fighter. I think all in all that he clearly was the bigger man over Canelo. I don't think that that's an excuse. A certain amount of people are <laughs> stating that that's an excuse. Well, I don't think that that's really an excuse. I think that maybe an excuse overall, if you were to talk about size, I think maybe an excuse maybe would be if we were to talk about someone like, let's say, maybe if Mikey Garcia had fought someone at 140 pounds. Maybe that would be something of an excuse. But Canelo Alvarez very clearly is not a natural 175 pounder. Dimitri Bivol was lengthier. He was bigger. It just is what it is. But at the end of the day, Canelo Alvarez, in my view, he did need to put on a better performance. But the next opponent apparently has been revealed to be Gennady Golovkin in a trilogy fight. Do I believe that that fight, in my view, is as big or is it as good? Is Gennady Golovkin the same fighter that he was a few years ago? In my opinion, no, he wasn't. But... At the end of the day, I do think that this fight does make sense for a multitude of reasons. And I think that this fight is good for Canelo Alvarez. Because when a fighter loses in the way that Canelo Alvarez was able to lose, I don't think that an immediate rematch, I don't think all in all that that is really overall what Canelo Alvarez really needs in his career. 
And that was kind of the same thing that I was saying about Mr. Deontay Wilder after he ended up losing very, very dominantly in the Tyson Fury rematch. But his fans, like that of a Dante's Boxing Nation, since they really did not care overall that much, and they really just wanted Deontay Wilder to get redemption no matter what. They were basically telling all these lies. They basically were telling all these myths about Tyson Fury allegedly cheating and putting something in the gloves and poisoning the water and all this other bullshit. And it led to Deontay Wilder taking an immediate rematch that in my view, and it's up to Deontay Wilder at the end of the day, but in my view, it probably would have benefited Deontay Wilder probably not to take the immediate rematch, probably to have a couple of tune-up fights, maybe gradually increase the level of competition, and then fight Tyson Fury. Because when you end up getting your ass kicked or when you end up losing dominantly in a fight, it's not always great to have an immediate rematch. Sometimes you got to reflect on things, get back in your mojo, get back in your groove, and overall then you will be more prepared in that fight. We'll see if things turn out for Canelo Alvarez in that light. We'll see what happens. But it is not going to be an easy task. But anyways, Mr. Dante's Boxing Nation, he's going to talk about it. I'm going to tune in. Dante's Boxing Nation, what's going on, guys? So some pretty interesting news. <laughs> According to boxing reporter Michael Benson, Canelo Alvarez is indicating he won't be fighting against Dimitri Bivol in a rematch in his next fight. Instead, he's going to move down to 168 and fight against the 40-year-old Gennady Golovkin. Now, even though this is not an official announcement, this news wouldn't really surprise that many people. Because outside of the judge's help, Canelo Alvarez, he has almost no chance of beating Bivol in a rematch. I mean, the fact that Bivol even... Um, well, I'm not going to say that Canelo Alvarez has no chance, but of course Dante would state that because... <laughs> because overall he does not like Canelo Alvarez, and he's really hoping that Canelo Alvarez, that at this point, that he's pretty much going to be maneuvered out of the way. That overall, that Canelo Alvarez, that... Hopefully he loses for another time to one of these other top contenders and that basically Dante doesn't ever have to hear about him ever again. That's what Dante is hoping for. We'll end up seeing what happens. But like I said, uh, in my view, I thought that Canelo Alvarez could have put on a much better performance than what he did in the Dimitri Bavol fight. I thought that once Canelo Alvarez was adjusting to him in round two and round three and four, I thought that Canelo Alvarez, in my view, won pretty much every single one of those rounds. But every round after round four, I thought Canelo Alvarez, I thought that his stamina looked very poor. I thought all in all that he clearly was not in regular fighting condition. And that, in my opinion, is the main reason what caused Canelo Alvarez to lose the fight. Now, don't get me wrong, Dimitri Bivo, his skill set and what he was able to do, you know, that was also a big part of the reason why Canelo Alvarez ended up losing the fight. But I also think that Canelo Alvarez's stamina and level of conditioning was so horrible in that fight that... I mean, he literally almost looked like a subpar fighter. It is what it is. But Canelo Alvarez, hopefully, at least for him, he's able to come back from this because I do believe he is a great fighter. And we'll see all in all how well he's able to adapt. Will he adapt as well as some of the other all-time great fighters before him? Or overall, will he not adapt that well? We'll see what happens. It'll be very, very interesting. But in my opinion, what Canelo Alvarez mainly has to do in order to win that Demetri Bavo rematch, he is going to have to lose some of that muscle mass that he clearly gained I think that Canelo Alvarez thought that gaining muscle mass and gaining some power, that that would be the main way to beat Demetri Bivo, and that maybe, hopefully, that Demetri Bivo was going to be scared and knocked out somewhat early, but it didn't happen that way. To be honest with you, <laughs> that was kind of the same game plan that Deontay Wilder had against Tyson Fury in the third match, and of course, that did not work out, because if you think that you're just going to gain some muscle mass against a very, very decently skilled fighter, kind of like how Deontay Wilder did against that of Tyson Fury, and that if you're just going to go in there and knock him out and try to bulldoze him, that's not going to work. You have to have a very high level of conditioning. You have to have a multitude of game plans. You have to have a very, very good game plan. You have to have a very great strategy, and you have to be willing to take it up a notch. Canelo Alvarez, if he is going to win the Demetri Bavo rematch, he has to take it up a couple of notches, not even just one notch. He has to take it up a couple of notches in order to win that rematch. And Demetri Bivo, if he even wants to end up winning that rematch, like I said, the person in the rematch, especially when it comes to, you know, a certain type of fights, it is not only the person that ended up losing the fight that has to, you know, adapt. It's also the person that ends up winning the fight who also ends up having to adapt. That's why Tyson Fury ended up winning the Deontay Wilder rematches in the fashion that he did, because he ended up adjusting. And overall, Deontay Wilder, I don't think that he really expected that Tyson Fury was adjusting in a certain way that he was going to. So both Canelo Alvarez and Demetri Bivo, 
they are going to have to make certain adjustments in that fight. But it'll be very interesting. Offered to come down to 168 and fight Canelo Alvarez in a rematch after Canelo made excuses about the weight, that further proves that even Canelo Alvarez himself... Well, is it really an excuse, or is Canelo Alvarez really naturally smarter than that of Dimitri Bivo? Uh, you know, there's a reason why I like to review these videos. You know, some people come on my channel and they say, oh, well, it sounds like you're hating on these guys. Listen, I don't have the time, and <laughs> I, to be honest with you, I really don't have the energy to consistently hate on anybody. The reason overall why I end up reviewing these videos is because... A lot of the times, it just is what it is. A lot of these channels, they're pretty much full of shit. All right? It just is what it is. And these are not the only channels that I tend to review. I also end up reviewing Skip and Shannon when I think that I have to. Uh, certain tennis, you know, talks because I end up reviewing the sport of tennis as well. Uh, you know, uh, Skip and Shannon, ESPN First Take, you know, whoever the hell I think that I need to review, depending on the sport that I'm talking about. If you've watched my NFL football videos, you know that I've reviewed a little bit of Ryan Clark talking about Aaron Rodgers. So any narrative that I see unfit, any narrative that I maybe see as super duper biased or something of a sort, I will comment on. And let's be real about Dante's boxing nation. He certainly is not the most logical and objective brother out there. It just is what it is. Self knows. But once again, this is the same guy that claimed that apparently overall that Tyson Fury, that he had this massive weight advantage over Deontay Wilder and... That was the main reason why Deontay Wilder ended up losing to Tyson Fury. Not only that, but, you know, the cheating and all this other bullshit when it came down to it. But then when Canelo Alvarez, when he actually does, you know, he clearly was the smaller fighter in this fight. He says, well, it's just an excuse. Well, listen, Canelo does have to be criticized to a degree. Because Canelo, once again, was the favorite in this fight. He certainly should have put on a better performance than what he did. I don't think Canelo Alvarez won any more than four rounds in the fight. I thought that Demetri Bavo clearly won the fight. And once again, I thought that Dimitri Bavol clearly won the fight because not only did Dimitri Bavol do certain things that I said that he would have to do, but Canelo Alvarez, his conditioning, once again, was just so piss poor in the fight that really, he really had no chance to win the fight after the first four or five rounds. So it just is what it is. But anyway. It's going to be a very difficult challenge to avenge that loss he just took. Now, if Canelo Alvarez... I agree. Let's follow through with this plan to fight against Gennady Golovkin next instead of Dimitri Bivol. That means he's going the Oscar De La Hoya route, at least in terms of Oscar De La Hoya losing to Shane Mosley. Now, what's very interesting here in this video, and this is also why I wanted to review this, because when Canelo Alvarez was looked at as the number one pound for pound fighter, and when he before he ended up losing to Dimitri Bivol. What was the things that a lot of these channels ended up saying? And once again, this is why I end up reviewing their videos. Because they would tell you these certain things like, oh, Canelo Alvarez, they overrate him. They try to put him in conversations that he doesn't deserve to be in. They try to put him in conversations with a Juan Manuel Marquez, an Oscar De La Hoya, a Marco Antonio Barrera, and, you know, overall that Eric Morales. But then, <laughs> then now that Canelo Alvarez loses, all of a sudden the truth, at least in their opinion about some of these Mexican fighters, all of a sudden it comes out. So they try to tell you overall that they honor these Mexican fighters and, you know, Canelo disrespects them overall by doing the fights that he's doing. Listen, if we look at things logically and objectively, and if we're certainly talking about Oscar De La Hoya, and I know a lot of people may not agree with me on this, Canelo Alvarez is greater, he's more skilled, <laughs> he's just he's just better and greater than what an Oscar De La Hoya was. Oscar, a lot of the times, especially in the earlier parts of his career, don't get me wrong, great fighter, he was beating up guys that <laughs> were guys that were pretty much almost nowhere near his same size. And by the time that he really was fighting guys that were his own same size, he clearly was having difficulties. So it just is what it is. Don't get me wrong, Canelo Alvarez is, you know, beating some guys that clearly were smaller than him, but he's also beaten guys that have been bigger than him and people overall that have been decently skilled and people all know that have been around his own same size. People like a Gennady Chubji Golovkin, an Arasani Laura, a Danny Jacobs, a Billy Joe Saunders, a Caleb Plant, a Callum Smith, even a Sergey Kovalev, even though, you know, he wasn't necessarily the same fighter. Could Oscar De La Hoya have done all those things when he would have had a major size disadvantage? I'm not so sure about that. That's not me claiming that every fighter that I just mentioned is, you know, necessarily a <laughs> A-plus fighter. But Oscar De La Hoya, in my view, in terms of his greatness, he's been a little bit more overrated than what he has been, you know, actually lived up to expectations. So Oscar De La Hoya, don't get me wrong, you know, he can talk all the shit that he wants to about Canelo Alvarez. He is not the fighter of what a Canelo Alvarez was. 
when Oscar De La Hoya lost to Shane Mosley. Or is, excuse me. The first time. And he's going to talk about Shane Mosley as well. He's going to bring up a point that I actually think is very, very decent. And uh, we're going to be talking about that here in a moment because this is an argument that a lot of people have really tried to bestow. And I've never really understood the argument because many people try to compare the loss that Oscar De La Hoya had to Sugar Shane Mosley. And, well, that's not the first loss of his career, I believe. I believe the first loss was against Felix Tito Trinidad. But when you have Sugar Shane Mosley, Sugar Shane Mosley was a 135-pounder coming up to 147 pounds. Now, when Canelo, of course, lost to Floyd Mayer the Jr., Floyd Mayer the Jr., you can argue, is at least a natural 140-pounder. So it's understandable. But when we talk about the levels of Shane Mosley and Floyd Mayer the Jr., Shane Mosley was never looked at as the true number one pound-for-pound pound fighter in the whole sport of boxing. Never, ever once in his career. And there's a reason why Shane Mosley ended up losing a lot of the bigger fights in his career, even against fighters that were similarly sized, like that of a Miguel Cotto. In my opinion, Miguel Cotto was a better boxer in terms of boxing IQ and in terms of the dimensions that he had. Miguel Cotto, in my view, was a better boxer than what Shane Mosley was. But Shane Mosley, you know, even though he was a decently great boxer himself, he did have certain limitations. That's why he lost to Floyd. That's why he ended up losing to Miguel Cotto. That's why he ended up losing to a certain amount of other guys or even having trouble, you know, or problems against Ricardo Mayorga. So Oscar De La Hoya losing to someone of a Shane Mosley, even though he was at his absolute best, it is completely different in my opinion. You can't even compare it to when Canelo Alvarez ended up losing to Floyd Mayer the Jr. Because Floyd Mayer the Jr., in my view, is at least the top 10 boxer of all time. Okay, Shane Mosley, there is there is no debate whatsoever about Shane Mosley being a top 10 boxer of all time. Never. It's really even a debate if Shane Mosley is within the top 50 boxers of all time. But it just is what it is. Anyway. And just keep in mind, for those of you guys who don't know, Oscar, he had also lost to Shane Mosley in the amateurs. In fact, Oscar De La Hoya, he felt that Shane Mosley was so good as an amateur... <laughs> That when Oscar went to the Olympic trials, Oscar moved up to a higher weight class so he wouldn't have to fight Shane Mosley again in the Olympic trials. So after Oscar De La Hoya lost to Shane Mosley in the pros, after Shane actually moved up two weight classes, by the way. So after Oscar lost to Shane Mosley, Oscar understood, as Eddie put it, back-to-back -back losses would be a really, really bad look. He decided to not even try to avenge the loss, he ended up not fighting Shane Mosley until three... Uh, once again, overall, I can't really uh, talk about the alleged ducking because I really was not, you know, around during that time or I was not, you know, watching boxing critically or, excuse me, critically at that time. But it's just funny because when Canelo Alvarez was ranked as a number one pound-for-pound -pound fighter, he said that, <clears throat> excuse me, he said that comparing Canelo to even an Oscar De La Hoya is basically shameful because... Apparently, Canelo Alvarez, apparently he ducks all these guys, and Oscar De La Hoya fought nothing but the best. Then all of a sudden, it comes out now that Canelo Alvarez has lost. You know, Marquez has allegedly ducked fights, you know, Barrera and Oscar De La Hoya. So, Dante, once again, he was full of shit to begin with. Overall, he knows that Canelo Alvarez is a greater fighter than those guys, but he knows that Canelo Alvarez, that he cannot put him on that high of a level. At least he does not want to because he does not want Canelo Alvarez to be in an all-time great conversation. Anyway. Years later, after Shane... And on top of that, of course, the main objective, he did not want him to be the number one pound-for-pound -pound fighter. Mosley had already lost to Vernon Forrest. That's when he decided to take the rematch. Right after De La Hoya lost to Shane Mosley, his return bout was against Artul Gatti. Artul Gatti, who had to move up multiple weight classes and was still way smaller than Oscar De La Hoya. That's who Oscar De La Hoya decided to face instead of doing the rematch with Shane Mosley. He followed that up by fighting some guy who had four losses on his record. Then he fought Fernando Vargas immediately after Fernando Vargas got knocked out by Felix Tito Trinidad. And just a side note, guys, it wasn't that long ago that Fernando... Well, you know what, Dante? I don't necessarily have a problem with you bringing these up. Uh, but the only thing that I would say is this. You have to be very consistent with who you talk about. Because when Canelo Alvarez and Vasily Lomachenko, when they were looked at as on the top of the sport, basically what these guys like Aki TV and Dante's Boxing Nation, basically what they would allege is that they would fight nothing but leftovers. That they would fight nothing but fighters that 
had already had losses on their list. And we, we have to, you know, and, and, you know, this is actually, for those of you that have seen my tennis videos, this is something that um, the Rafael Nadal and Roger Federer fans have actually argued in terms of Novak Djokovic for my argument and a certain amount of other arguments that Novak Djokovic, in my view, is actually ahead of both of those players. Now, Rafael Nadal, now that he has, you know, 21 Grand Slams, you know, he's he's debatably over Djokovic or he's right there with him at least. But, I mean, <laughs> I mean, if you pay attention to tennis, let's just be real. The only reason why Nadal pretty much won that 21st Grand Slam is because Australia pretty much barred Djokovic from it. But, you know, that, that's a conversation for another time. But anyways, when it comes down to it, they tried to argue the same thing with Mr. Novak Djokovic. They tried to say that the only reason why Djokovic was dominant against Roger Federer and Rafi Nadal eventually was because they were getting older and they were slowing down. When in fact that was not the case. The reason why Novak Djokovic ended up doing better than them and getting a leading record over them is because he eventually became the better player peak v peak. That is the reason why Novak Djokovic eventually surpassed them, in my opinion, at least in terms of skill, in terms of peak. Because they tried to act like they were completely out of their prime and that was just not the case. That is a bullshit lie that has been spread by a certain amount of the tennis media to pretty much dismantle Novak Djokovic's case as the greatest of all time. And Dante basically has been trying to do that with certain fighters that he doesn't like, except with certain fighters that he does like, like a Terrence Bud Crawford. That's why if you see Javante Tank Davis beat up a Yuriorkas Gamboa, he'll claim that he was a former champion. If you see David Benavidez, someone that they've been pushing very, very heavily to try and dismantle Canelo Alvarez, they'll push him very, very heavily. And any fighter that will be so say, oh, he was a former champion, he was this. But Canelo Alvarez apparently defeating undefeated champions. Apparently he's fighting them at their worst or he's fighting fighters that have already been knocked out. But Terrence Crawford, for example, when he beats a Kelbrook or Amir Khan, who were completely washed up fighters at that point in time when it came down to it, apparently those fighters were former champions. So I can see Dante's bullshit from a mile away. Once again, is no offense against the dude. But you can tell overall which fighters that he's trying to promote in a highlight and which fighters he's trying to promote in a low light is just very obvious. No Vargas actually said that Canelo Alvarez is the greatest Mexican fighter of all time. I mean, if he says that, that makes you wonder. If Canelo is... And you can debate that Canelo Alvarez is the greatest Mexican fighter of all time. You can debate that. And I know a certain amount of people are not going to agree with that. Listen, in my opinion, it's either Canelo Alvarez or Julio Cesar Chavez Sr. Because even if we're going to talk about Julio Cesar Chavez Sr., what fights did Julio Cesar Chavez Sr. really win, in my opinion, to where it would just 100%, you know, without a doubt, put him over Canelo Alvarez? I mean, did he defeat Oscar De La Hoya? Did he defeat, you know, Sweet Pea Pernell Whitaker? Did he defeat him? No, he didn't defeat either of those guys. What fighters did he really beat that would 100% put him over so would Canelo Alvarez? That's not me saying that he did not have a fantastic career, because he did. But Canelo Alvarez and Julio Cesar Chavez... In terms of the greatest Mexican fighters of all time, in my opinion, is pretty much between those two. And of course, Salvador Sanchez, a lot of people would think that he deserves a right, but I'm sorry, but in terms of the accomplishments, he's just not there. All right, he's just not there. Greatest Mexican fighter of all time? Who's the worst? Who would he say is the most overrated? I mean, because saying something like that, that's not really giving Mexican fighters too much credit. So, uh, well, no, actually, he's giving them a lot of credit because Canelo Alvarez. He is an all-time great fighter. Uh, you've been basically trying to deny the fact that he is an all-time great fighter because you do not want Canelo Alvarez looked at as an number one pound-for-pound pound fighter, which at the current moment in time, I don't think that he can be claimed as because, of course, he lost his last fight, but we'll see what he can do to adapt. And on top of that, you don't want him in an all-time great conversation. It was the same thing with, with Vasily Lomachenko. It was the same thing. It's also the same thing with Tyson Fury. He does not like those fighters. Okay, he does not like those fighters. Once again, just like Oscar De La Hoya did not have the confidence that he would be able to beat Shea Mosley, Canelo doesn't have the confidence that he would be able to beat Bivol at 175 or 168. Now, Eddie Hearn, he was already saying that Canelo Alvarez, regardless if he decides to fight Golovkin, he's going to definitely be fighting against Bivol after that. But regardless... Well, you know, what I'll say is this about Mr. Canelo Alvarez. Sometimes it's not always the best of ideas to rematch someone immediately after you just had a very, very bad loss. Because oftentimes, if you go into that fight, your mentality is not going to be the same. Your mojo is not going to be the same. Your confidence is not going to be the same. So Canelo Alvarez has to be very careful here. I think all in all that he has to be very careful. 
once again, just like with the Deontay Wilder situation, you, sometimes you just can't go straight into a rematch where you ended up getting your ass whooped because sometimes that's going to end up worse for wear. And I don't think a certain amount of people understand that. I don't think Dante understood that because there's no offense against Dante, but he's not really the sharpest tool in the shed. Just is what it is. That's why they were all calling for Deontay Wilder to overall rematch Tyson Fury immediately because they said, oh, he needs his redemption and he needs this. The best way for Deontay Wilder to have redemption, at least for himself, for to get that quote-unquote revenge over Tyson Fury by beating him was to be honest with himself. And unfortunately, certain people like Dante's Boxer Nation, they were not honest with Deontay Wilder. They were more into giving excuses, really some of the dumbest excuses and some of the some of the most outrageous excuses that I personally ever heard, not only in boxing history, but sports history. Some of the most outrageous excuses, and that is why you guide Deontay Wilder, why he did not end up winning that fight any better, why he didn't look any better in that third fight, because he was not a different man. Canelo Alvarez, if he is going to win against Demetri Bivol, he's going to have to be a different man. He's going to have to be a different fighter. Just is what it is. He is going to have to be different. Okay, he's going to have to be different. Canelo Alvarez decides to fight Golovkin first, and then he fights Bivol right after that and loses to him again. It's still going to be a bad look no matter what. The only major difference is Canelo Alvarez, he will make more money fighting against Gennady Golovkin right now than fighting him after he ends up losing to Piffle twice. So my main point is, don't be surprised if Canelo completely walks away from the Piffle rematch, or at least he takes it two or three years from now, like Oscar De La Hoya did when it came to Shane Mosley. But regardless what Canelo... Well, you know what, to be fair, that may not be that of the worst of ideas. And a certain amount of people may disagree with that. But once again, when Deontay Wilder, when he ended up losing against that of Tyson Fury, I was one of the people that said that maybe it would be a good idea for Deontay Wilder to kind of back up, get a new coach, get a new staff, and then maybe face Tyson Fury in a couple of years. Because when you end up, once again, when you end up getting your ass whooped or when you end up getting dominated in a fight, and listen, there's just no no way else to put it. I like Canelo. I think that he's an all-time great fighter. Not even just a great fighter. I think that he is an all-time great fighter. But he did not look good in that Demetri Bavol fight. So he may even want to think about taking a couple of fights or maybe finishing business at the lower weight divisions before he even thinks about going back up to 175. Or maybe face a Lunga Makabu. Maybe face a Lunga Makabu. Maybe face Gennady Golovkin, Olunga Makabu. See how you handle Olunga Makabu. Makabu is not the same threat as a Demetri Bivol, but he is heavy, even a little bit heavier than Demetri Bivol. So that may actually be a good training exercise for that of Canelo Alvarez. We'll see what he does. Canelo Alvarez decides to do, he is in a hell of a conundrum right now. Because even if he doesn't take the Bivol fight, there is going to be an enormous amount of pressure on Canelo Alvarez to take either the David Benavidez fight or the Jamal Charlo fight. Remember, PBC, they are... Uh, those could be possibly great fights as well. I think that those would be easier fights, in my opinion. Certainly, the Jamal Charlo fight would be easier. Uh, if you're talking about all the fights that would be available, that, in my view, would be debatable A-grade fights, I think that the Jamal Charlo fight probably would be the easiest. And Jamal Charlo was still a decent A-grade fighter. So I think I'll know that that would be a very, very great fight. But I think Canelo Alvarez for right now, I think the Gennady Golovkin fight, at least for him in terms of money and in terms of legacy, that that is the right thing to do. Not because I think Gennady Golovkin is necessarily at a better point in his career than a Jamal Charlo or David Benavidez, but because it would be worth a lot of money. A lot of people would be willing to see it, and it pretty much would be to finish the business between those two fighters. Not only that, but Canelo, he is going to have to get back in a better mojo. And then after he faces Gennady Golovkin... We'll see what he kind of does with himself. Uh, you know, Lunga Makabu could be interesting. Jamal Charlo, David Benavidez, maybe the Demetri Bivol rematch, to be quite honest with you. Canelo Alvarez, like I said, he may want to think about taking an immediate rematch with Demetri Bivol or maybe waiting a couple of years. That may help him out. That may help him out. But we'll see what happens. For Canelo Alvarez, the biggest two-fight deal that Canelo has ever had in his career, fighting against... Jamal Charlo, and then Errol Spence, or actually Errol Spence first at a catch weight of 164. Uh, once again, Dante, are you really even sure that you would give Canelo Alvarez credit? I mean, well, let me talk for you, because I know what you would do. You would not give him credit whatsoever. You would not give him credit whatsoever. And don't get me wrong, the Errol Spence Jr. fight is, you know, it's a very popular fight. 
I don't think that if Canelo shows up at his best, I don't really think that Errol Spence Jr. has a snowball's chance in hell. And that's not me insulting Errol Spence Jr.'s ability. He is a very great fighter, very, very great fighter. You know, even if he were to lose to that of a Terrence Crawford or Canelo Alvarez, he's still, in my opinion, a very decently great fighter. But in my opinion, he's just too small. You know, just too small. Then Jamal Charlo. So the pressure is not going to go away. The walls are still closing in. As long as old media keeps praising Canelo Alvarez as if he's pound for pound number one or even one of the best fighters in the world, that's just going to make the best fighters at 168 want to fight. And you can tell the way that Dante said that, that he does not personally want Canelo Alvarez to be remembered as one of the best fighters in the world. And that's how you know a difference between someone who is a critique and someone who is a criticizer and someone over who is a hater. Because if I were just to talk about someone, let's say, like a Terrence Bud Crawford, most of my criticisms of Terrence Bud Crawford is that I don't believe, even though I think that he's a fantastic fighter, I don't think that he really has the best of resumes. But that's something overall that you can necessarily prove. But if I were going, you know, and if I were making videos and saying, oh, well, we, you know, we have to talk about how Terrence Crawford, he's not even one of the best fighters in the world. He's not even top 10 pound per pound. That's how you know that someone is, okay, you know, this dude... He's a little bit out of pocket. You know, this guy, you know, he clearly has a very, very big issue with this guy for whatever reason. And I'm not a person overall that has a big issue with anybody. Like I said, I try to judge everyone very fairly and very logically, very objectively. That's just how I am. All right. But anyway. Canelo even more because the praise of Canelo Alvarez makes beating him again that much bigger. So old media, they think they're helping him by saying he's still the best, et cetera, et cetera. You guys are just making things worse for him. You're putting even more... Well, Canelo Alvarez, once again, he is a great fighter. And at the current moment in time, he still does have to remain within my top 10 pound per pound. But can he be the number one pound per pound fighter coming off of a loss, especially the way that he did in a fight where he was favored by minus 500? No. No, I can't have him as the number one pound per pound right now. But Canelo still probably would be within my top four to top six. So Canelo is a great fighter. There's no doubt about that if you're a logical and objective person. But it is going to be very interesting to see what Canelo does within these next few years. It's going to be very interesting. I don't really have a great doubt that he would defeat that of an Errol Spence Jr. or Jamal Charlo. Uh, Jamal Charlo, excuse me. Uh, or that of a David Benavidez if he shows up at his best. The big question will be what maybe he can do with that of the light heavyweight division, because I do believe that Canelo's dream is also to possibly unify that weight division. But we'll see what happens. For pressure, you're putting more of a target on Canelo Alvarez's back. So let's see what Canelo decides to do. Like I told you guys, regardless if he takes the Bivol fight next, if he takes the Golovkin fight next, there's really nowhere for Canelo Alvarez to go, even after the Golovkin fight. You either risk losing to Bivol again or you deal with once again the backlash of not fighting the best guys in your own division at 168 because he can no longer cherry pick and fight the John Ryders and the Plants, the Smiths, the Yodirums because Canelo has all... Right, but Smith and Billy Joe Saunders and Caleb Plant, those are not cherry picks. And once again, there's a reason why I review these videos because... If you listen to Dante's commentary, he'll tell you that Javante Tank Davis versus Rolly Romero, he'll tell you all in all that that is a fight that is worth pay-per-view. When really it's not, it's really a trash fight, and that's not me trying to degrade Javante Tank Davis in any way. That's just me telling what it is, because that is not a good fight, because Rolly Romero has no chance whatsoever. Caleb Plant, Callum Smith, and Billy Joe Saunders, at least we're all legitimate champions. Legitimate champions. Not just some guys all in all that you could push over. So it is what it is. Now, of course, Demetri Bivo, he's on another level. But, you know. Already been completely exposed by Demetri Bivo. So let's see what Canelo Alvarez decides to do. That's all I got for now, guys. I'm on to the next one. But anyways, that's pretty much about it for this video. But once again, it's going to be very, very interesting to see what Canelo Alvarez does next. I think, to be honest with you, even if Canelo Alvarez were to wait a couple years, possibly for the Demetri Bivo rematch, that may actually suit him well. And a certain amount of people, they may not agree with what I say there, but once again, certain people, they just want fighters to head into the ring immediately. 
and basically, you know, say, oh, well, you know, rematch this guy, you know, to prove how good you are. But sometimes it takes a little bit of time to recover and to recuperate from a match like that. And I think that that also would have helped other fighters like that of a Deontay Wilder or maybe other fighters that lost certain matches in that way. And then they were never able to recuperate overall in a rematch. But it is what it is. But anyways, that's pretty much about it for today. Thank you so much for watching. We will see what Mr. Soul Canelo Alvarez does from here. And I will talk to you all later.